All right, what is going on, Laker fans? Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I mean, does, does the man really need an introduction? Do I really have to say who he is and what he represents? Um, we got a, a fun show here on this Saturday, obviously talking Lakers basketball. I want to welcome in my good buddy, guest Trevor Lane of Lakers Nation. What's going on, Trev? Hey, Alan. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm glad we get to talk positive things about the or mostly positive stuff about the Lakers because of uh, uh the big the big win D'Angelo Russell's uh big explosive game but uh but yeah man I, I'm excited to come on here and, and talk Lakers with you well it, it's funny because listen I and I I'm being as genuine as I could possibly be you and I talked maybe a couple of days ago about hey let, let's let's do something on Saturday and I did not think it was going to be coming off a of W so I'm with you that there, there is it's kind of it's an interesting vibe in Lakerland today, it, it, and I think every game is just so all over the place that it, I, I'm sure your interaction with Laker fans and your just mo, your own emotions and feelings is a little bit all over the place. But yes, it's coming off a W, so um, you know obviously that's a good thing right there. Um, okay, let, let let's start off with this because I could spend some time talking about tomorrow's game. I could spend some time. Uh, talking about yesterday's game, but before I even do that, just can you give me your overall thoughts? The the positioning of where the Lakers are right now. Yes, they're in the ninth in the Western Conference, but I, if you want to take this approach this a little bit more from a standings perspective, feel free to. Or if you just want to talk about how you feel about the overall team and um, how dangerous they could be or how vulnerable they can be. Yeah, I mean, it has been a Jekyll and Hyde season for the Lakers. You never know what you're going to see out of them game in, game out. I mean, the, the, the game against the Kings followed up immediately by a great uh, win against the Bucs. Uh, that, that's a perfect microcosm of what the season has been. You just never know really what you're going to get out of this team. But uh, on the positive side, the ceiling is there for them, right? This is a team that has the ability to take their game to another level. We saw it during the in-season tournament. And we can get into the reasons why they're so hot and cold and why we see them struggle at times. Other games, they're good. But I think the bottom line when we look at, at this squad is that they are consistently inconsistent. And that's, that's what is the makeup of this team right now. And it's unfortunate. You'd like to be able to see them really solidify things. But when you take a step back and you look at their winning percentage, when you look at where they're currently sitting in the standings, they're currently sitting in the nine seed, but the Warriors have a super light schedule and they're standing right there. But you go back and you look at the win percentage last season because we tend to think of last season in a favorable way, right? We think of last season and despite the way it ended, we think of that great run post-trade deadline on. Well, the Lakers this season are winning at a higher clip than that team finished with. And again, that team was trying to overcome a more than half a season of the, the Russell Westbrook Lakers that was a mess. But still, the team that we're seeing right now is actually winning at a higher percentage than the team last season. Not by a lot, not by as much as we would have hoped, but it's still a higher percentage. But the perception is very different in part because we came in with higher expectations of the season, but also because last season's team, they worked their way all the way up to the seventh seed. And at that point, that felt really good. Right now, the Lakers are sitting in the nine seed, and I think that's a big shift we've seen in the Western Conference, or at least the continuation of the progression of the quality of the conference and the depth that we're seeing. And so the Lakers, despite the quality that they've shown in some nights, their inability to get above the nine seed right now is a reflection of how good the West is at the moment, even compared to last season. Again, a lesser winning percentage last season equated to the seven seed. Right now, winning more games has the Lakers in the nine seed, and they're just tr barely trying to keep their head above water right now. The Western Conference is no joke, but it also has a lot of parity, which means the Lakers are probably a little bit better than what their record suggests they are, at least at their best. And that gives me hope that come playoff time, they can give almost anybody a run for their money. Yeah, I like the way you position that because I do agree with you that the perception – there was an expectation this year is, hey, you're coming out the Western Conference Finals. There's a lot of people that like what the Lakers did in the offseason. There's a lot of people that thought, hey, they got a ton of flexibility if they want to make a move, if they want to do something. They got they got options at the trade deadline. They didn't end up doing anything at the trade deadline. Um, the most games they've been above 500 is five games all year. They've done it a couple times after the win yesterday against the Bucks. Here they are back at five games over 500. I... I it's. I think it's the proper comparison. You can't compare this season to last year 
But I think you ended the season on such a high, even though you got swept by the Nuggets, you got a lot further than you thought you were going to be. I thought they'd be top three, top four in the Western Conference, something along those lines. I think every point that you made is fair, but I also think those who are pessimistic about the team, that's fair too. I, I, I've kind of gone on this roller coaster with the Lakers, which I think every Laker fan has. Every time I feel like, wait a minute, are they going somewhere? Is, is this? Are they starting to get to um, a place where this is the Laker team that we all signed up for? They give you a game to be discouraged, or they give you a couple of games where you kind of scratch your head and it's like, well, I thought I kind of knew who they were. I, do you feel like you know what this team is? I mean, I, I like your description of they're consistently inconsistent. Do you feel like you know what they are, or maybe that's this is exactly who they are? Remember that quote Bron had, said we could beat anybody, we could also get our ass kicked by anybody? Maybe that's just who they are, and that's what they're going to be up until playoff time. I think part of it has to do with what they've become as a team, and that is a team that is very reliant upon their offense. They've done a complete 180 mm. in terms of what they are as a team compared to last season. Last season, their post-trade deadline run was fueled by a massive step up on the defensive side of the ball. They became one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. That's what fueled their run. This season, it's the offense. They're one of the better three-point shooting teams in the NBA go figure right i mean it's been it's literally been uh, i think it's been a decade since we've seen a lakers team rank this high in three point percentage uh, their offense is fueling everything for them their defense not so much in fact before the bucks game i haven't looked today to see what the result of the bucks game really did but uh coming into the bucks game since the all star break they ranked 28th in defensive rating they've been getting crushed on that end of the floor. And so I think inherently when your defense is struggling and you're relying upon your offense to pull you through, they were eighth in offensive rating heading into the Bucks game. What that does, because offense has more variance to it, defense night in, night out, you can lock down. Sure, guys will get hot certain nights, but there's more consistency found in, in defense. So I think inherently with the team making the shift to become more of an offense-driven team, uh, that's going to create even more of a roller coaster effect, which is why we're on these emotional highs and lows. If they're shooting great, they look fantastic. And if their offense struggles, well, they're not getting stops on the other end either. And they, well, and we saw what happened against Sacramento. So I think that's part of the inconsistency is it's not just the team's been riding these highs and lows or they're playing harder one game than the next. I think it's also the style of team that they've become is just naturally leads to more of this these fluctuations that we're seeing. Yeah, it's funny because you're right. I mean, there was a point. Remember when D'Lo was taken out of the starting lineup? I remember there was – Darvin Ham had some type of quote of, we want to have an identity. If we're going to have an identity, it's going to be on the defensive side. And you're right. It's completely shifted. It's not – you know, the, the thought process and the mentality. They beat the Bucks yesterday. I know it's kind of ironic that it's Dinwiddie getting a stop and getting a block and it's a defensive stop, but they beat them because D'Lo was unconscious, that they hit 16 threes. They shot 47% from the three-point line. They beat them because of their offense, right? Yep. That they had – they punched every time that the Milwaukee Bucks punched. Um, this actually takes me – I think it's a perfect transition. Um, man, what an interesting – if we were in mid-December – and I told you to describe D'Angelo Russell on the Lakers, and I told you to describe what you thought the future of D'Angelo Russell was going to be on the Lakers. And then here we sit today on March 9th, about a month away from the playoff starting, and and, and the perception of D'Angelo Russell has completely changed. So I, I want to I wanna just kind of get your opinion on D'Lo. Trevor, what's changed? What, what, what happened to the player that everybody was talking about, even the moment he signed his contract in the summer mm -hmm. and you knew that there was, there was not a trade clause. There was already trying to figure out we we're probably two weeks into the season. It's like, Hey, Zach Levine might be available or DeJounte Murray. Think about just this, this, um, this, this slow progression to where he is today. What, what have you noticed most with D'Angelo Russell and how is this dude all of a sudden becoming such an integral, integral part of any success that the Lakers are going to have? It's going to have to be with him. So 
I think there's a few things that's, that's happened here with D'Angelo Russell. And Austin Reeves actually gave us a little bit of foreshadowing um, when I talked to him last summer. And I asked him, who who's going to make the leap this year for the Lakers? Who do you think is going to take the step forward? Honestly, I was expecting him to say Max Christie because that, that was coming out of Summer League. And he said D'Angelo Russell. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. And now you've seen what D'Angelo Russell has done over the course of the season and how he's grown. It may, Austin's prediction, he's very close with D'Lo, it makes sense now when you're seeing the the maturation of him, of D'Angelo Russell as a person, you're seeing the maturation of his game. I thought uh, he he explained it pretty well when he said that essentially what's happened with, with D'Angelo Russell, he went on that slump in, in December and it was tough and Lakers fans were saying, oh my gosh, we got to trade this guy. What do we do with this guy? He yeah. couldn't hit shots. He looked like he lost his confidence. He got hurt. So he bruised his tailbone. He missed three games with a bruised tailbone. And during those three games, he said he basically sat there the whole time and picked out the areas of the floor that there were openings. And he started to, it said it, it like it clicked at that point. He started to recognize where he could, he could make more of an impact. So just being forced to sit on the sideline and watch, it's like drafting a rookie quarterback, right? And having them sit the Patrick Mahomes, uh, example, right? Sit and watch for a little bit, and then you can get in there, right? So D'Angelo Russell kind of had that injury-forced sort of sideline timeout, whatever, mm -hmm. for, in his season where he had to just sit and watch, and that was all he could do. And he picked out some areas where he could be more effective. And then since then, he has been on an absolute tear. And then in last night's game, I think the way he's reading the game, this is really the key to his step forward as a player. He's reading the game at a different level. It's not just that he went and he, and he put up 44 points. He did it by playing in pick and roll basketball, by getting to open spots. He's not the quickest player. He's not the most athletic player. But just by using his smarts, he's getting he's to the creative. right spots on the floor. He's creative, absolutely. And then after the game, Spencer Dinwiddie credited D'Lo for the guy who told him like what, what to do. What yeah, what to do, what Dame was gonna do. And Dinwiddie is the the elder player here, but D'Lo knew the tendencies of Damian Lillard and he told him what was going to happen. He also, if you watch the game, that big steal for Austin Reeves at the end of the third, D'Lo was the guy who was calling that out, who was telling Austin what Giannis was gonna do. I think the way he reads the game and sees the game has gone to another level. And I think that three game stretch when he was hurt, I think that was the catalyst for all of this. So yesterday, Trev, um, I'm watching the game as we both are. And Billy Mack, Bill McDonald, you know, had kind of a similar story of how the crediting his time away to just sit on the bench and kind of look at things from a different perspective mm -hmm. um, to however that's helping him right now. But it's just a, such a crazy swing for me because, again, I think it's the perspective of here's a player, and I'm guilty of this too. And it, I don't think, Trev, it's just Laker fans that were saying, get uh, D'Angelo Russell out of here in December. I think it was also a lot of the media. I think there was a lot of, you know, certainly, um, hey, we got to win right now. Like we don't have we don't have time to fi figure this out. Plus, it wasn't too long before that you had that playoff run where D'Angelo Russell virtually wasn't used or could not be used against the Denver Nuggets. So that's sticking in a lot of people's head. So I, by, by the way, I think the criticism was fair. I don't think that the criticism was unwarranted, but my point is, is that how quickly he's turned this around to become the player that he is. Let's go back to yesterday's game. Cause I think, I think last night's game is a good example. He hit nine of 12 from the three point line. Obviously, that's just an unbelievable, ridiculous percentage. That's not always, you're not shooting 75% from three every game. But I like what you said about it wasn't technically just his threes. It's how can I get Dame behind me or to my side? And now I'm confusing Brooke Lopez, or now I'm confusing Damian Lillard. Now I'm basically going to get the shot that I want. Don't forget, Lakers were down six. With, you know, once Dame hit that that three and, and got the foul as well, it was D'Lo that found Rui, kind of created that pressure to get Rui the open three. And then it was basically D'Lo on the screen and roll of hitting those tough couple of runners that got the Lakers eventually the lead. And then they held on to the, to the game right there. But the reason why I point that out is yesterday was just, it's easy to just look at the 44 points or just the threes. He was doing more than just hitting threes. Nine dimes on top of that. It, it's it's the best performance that I've seen from D'Angelo Russell. It's got to be very encouraging for Laker fans and certainly that mm -hmm. front office there that he's doing what he's doing. And 
I guess my question to you, Trev, and then we'll move on from D'Lo, um, what gives you confidence that this is sustainable? What gives you confidence that if the Lakers are in a seven-game set in the playoffs, because I don't think that's a guarantee, we'll, we'll see what happens, what gives you confidence that D'Lo can continue to be this much of an asset? So I think it's because he's, I, I believe he's taken a step forward in terms of how he's reading the game right now. Uh, shooting will come and go. That just naturally, there's going to be variance in shooting. Steph Curry has nights where he does not shoot great. And I've he's, never had an off night ever. Right, okay. I want you to it, not, never. Al, Alan Sliwa excluded. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, shooting, there's just naturally variance bank, baked in. Uh, but if it's if it's not a Sliwa out there on, on the yes. floor, if it's Thank anybody you. if it's anybody else, Thank you, then Thank you. you're gonna have those ups and downs. And and D'Angelo Russell, we can expect that. He's going to have his off games too, where he doesn't shoot the ball as well. But I do think he's reading the floor in a different way. Um and one of the, the evidence pieces for that, it's it, he's averaging a career low in turnovers. He had those nine assists last night, two turnovers, despite the insanely high usage. The Lakers, he mm. was the Lakers offense. Two turnovers. Like he is, he is taking care of the basketball uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. And I love that after the game, when he talked about the last shot, which ended up being the game winner, the last shot that he took, uh, he called out that the the Bucks messed up the coverage on it. He said he right. That's how he got the look that he got. He's like, oh, they messed up the coverage. I, something I say all the time, Alan. It's that. It, there's different levels of teams in the NBA. The worst teams in the NBA, you can make mistakes about against them, and they won't recognize it. I'm talking about when you're playing defense. You can make mistakes. Their offense won't recognize it. The mid-tier teams will recognize it, but they won't always punish you for it. They may notice that you made a mistake, but they don't always figure out the advantage from that and score off of that. The best teams, and this is what like Denver is so great at, they will recognize your mistake every time, and they will punish you for it. Every single time it's the guys that can recognize when a defense messes up and take advantage of it. Those are the players that really find success in today's NBA. And that's exactly what D'Angelo Russell was doing in last night's game. So that gives me confidence that this is it to some degree sustainable because it's not just him physically hitting shots. It's the mental side. He's reading the game in, at a higher level than I think we've ever seen. I think what will happen too with, with D'Lo is players like LeBron, obviously Anthony Davis, Darvin Ham, Austin Reeves, all these guys kind of noticing what he's done over the last couple of months. And I'm sure there's a tendency now much more confidently from those players to say, do your thing. And, and it's mm -hmm. it's that's got to be also something for D'Angelo Russell, where I'm sure at times as a Laker, when you have players like D or players like LeBron and Anthony Davis on your team, maybe you're a little bit more hesitant, but um, I'm sure he's getting more of the green light because the Lakers need it. And if he continues to play good basketball like that, which uh, hopefully that's the case, he's going to get more of that green light. Um, I know you get this topic a ton, I'm sure, on social and on, on Lakers Nation and when you're doing your your live broadcasts and everything else. Um, Darvin Ham's name is always brought up. And since he was became the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, there's always been – um, it just comes with the territory. Plus, he's not a proven head coach. Now, he's got one year under his belt, got to the Western Conference Finals. I think a lot of people don't want to give him enough credit for that. I think people really, really want to point out the things that he doesn't do well, and that's okay. That comes with the territory, and I'm not telling you he's a perfect coach. My question, Trev, is how much do you think of the positioning that the Lakers are in right now is because of Darvin Ham? And, and I don't mean that in a positive light. I mean more... Could they be a lot further if Darvin Ham um, wasn't the head coach or if Darvin Ham was a little bit more strategic with his plan B, C's and D's and everything else? Just your overall thoughts on Darvin Ham. Yeah, I, I think it's been a bit of a mess of a season for him. Um, and perhaps part of that is the, this huge shift with the team from going from a defensive team to an offensive team. But um, it, it's not been good. You, you can... Look, I, I try to give Darvin Ham credit every time we can because I feel like, like you mentioned there, we spend a lot of time talking about the negative stuff with Darvin. And it's also just inherent in sports where in things when things aren't going well, the coach gets a lot of flack. It's just, it's, it's just, it's what happens. And when, that's it, not, and when it's it, going well, they don't usually give it to the coach either. Yep. Exactly. And that's not something that's unique to basketball. That's across sports that we see that. But um, Darvin... He does a lot of things. I almost liken it to, which is kind of ironic, to to Russell Westbrook, right? Where Russell Westbrook 
got a ton of flack and some of it was deserved, mm -hmm. but a lot of it was coming because when he did make mistakes, they were loud mistakes. They were very noticeable mistakes. The ball goes flying out of bounds. He, he blows a layup or he hits the side of the backboard or whatever, you know, they were loud mistakes that everybody could see, right? It wasn't, Oh, he missed a, a rotation off ball. Sure. And, you know, that's the type of stuff that a lot of people won't notice. It wasn't that kind of mistake. He made a lot of mistakes. And, and Trev, what I also say too, not just a lot of mistakes. I think people were looking for him to make mistakes. And I, I think there's some similarities with, with Darwin on that. Yeah. And that's, and that's very true. So people are already hyper aware of what mm -hmm. Darvin Ham is doing, what he's not doing. People are very frustrated, I, me too, with his lack of timeout usage. I thought he was great, by the way, against the Bucs. I, I love giving him credit when, when we can. I thought his timeout usage was fantastic. The timeout usage, the rotations, midway through the season, saying, hey, I'm going to throw a lineup out there with no guards. I, I mean, crazy stuff that, that we've seen this season. So how much has that changed the season? I, I think it really comes down to this, Alan. Mm -hmm. How many more wins would you have gotten with a different coach during that rough stretch post in season tournament win? During that, what was it like a three and ten stretch or something like that? Yeah, I think you're right. Something like how, that. How many more wins do you get in that stretch? Because that is right now, that stretch is what's separating the Lakers being in the play in from being a solid locked in playoff team. Had you gone, you know, instead of instead of three and ten, if you won six or seven of those games instead sure, of three of those sure. games. That changes a ton in the standings in the NBA right now. So I, I do think that he's probably cost them at least a few wins this season. Um, and I think his long-term status with the team, it's going to be determined by what happens from here on out, what happens in the postseason. Uh, I was hoping that we would see, from an effort perspective, more consistency with this team under Darvin Ham because he's supposed to be the guy that you just constantly want to run through a brick wall for. And I like Darvin the person. I think he's a good dude, but um, I don't know. I I don't know if he's going to be the long-term coach for the Lakers. I think that's something that's going to get looked at this summer. Well, I think, by the way, I think that's kind of wide. A lot of people, I think, share the, a similar opinion, and I've got a chance to interact with him many times. He's a good dude. Like, yeah. I'm I'm a fan, and it's it's tough when you get to – know somebody across paths with them. I don't know them well at all, but I'm saying just the interactions that you have with that that person, you want them to succeed. I like his story. I like uh, how he was a journeyman in the NBA. He's a uh, hard nose, roll up your sleeve, come to work every day. I like his mm -hmm. um, progression as an assistant coach to then get the opportunity, but I'm with you. I, I think there's a lot of question marks around, hey, is this the right guy? And um, I'll, I'll ask you this on Darvin. If I think it's safe to say, if the Lakers, let's say they make the playoffs, but they drew Denver in the first round, and they're out in the first round, um, even though it was Denver, do you think that's still a ticket for Darvin Ham of the Lakers saying, "All right, we're, we're going to move on and try to"? Because I, I already, listen. If they make the playing tournament and not the playoffs, and they're out, then I think we already have our answer. If they make the first round and they're eliminated, and it's not the Denver Nuggets, I think we have our answer. Mm -hmm. But what scenario do you think is out there where Darvin Ham could feel good about his third year as a Laker head coach? I, I think it would have to be that. It would have to be Denver, and it would have to be a loss in which you can say tactically uh, the Lakers did everything they could. Um, you would have to say, well, eh, there was nothing else they could have done because you look back at last year against Denver. What did Darvin do? He started the same lineup that beat the Golden State Warriors, a much smaller team. I, I thought Darvin made great adjustments in the playoffs last season in round one and round two. And then it was a, a a mess against Denver, and part of that is Denver is so good that you know that magnifies some things. But if it's a six game series, a seven game series against mm. Denver, and you have success, and the team looks good, and you're making all the right reads, the right rotations, and things like that, and he's pushing the right buttons, all right, th then maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough for where you say, okay, yeah, we're you're we're going to stick with you, and we're going to see where this goes. But if it's another thing where he tries some wacky stuff that on paper doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then in practice, the it doesn't, it doesn't work it. either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, then, then I think that's, uh, that'll be the end of that. All right. Well, that will be, that'll continue to be a conversation. I know that, um, last night, you know, uh, probably about actually in the afternoon, about three, four hours before the game starts, we find out about LeBron 
and he's unable to go. And uh, Darvin Ham talked a little bit about it, about it's more the wear and tear on LeBron James. Um, what, what's your just, you know, your thoughts? I, I have some concern. I'll tell you my concern. My concern is first off, he's in his 21st season. Um, he's 39 years old. All the playoff games that he's played. But put all that to the side. The fact that he checked himself out of the Sacramento Kings game with a little under four minutes left to play, grimacing and walking straight to the locker room. People say, oh, well, the Lakers were going to lose that game. Said, okay, well, Bron's not typically walking off the floor and checking mm-hmm. himself out. And then he doesn't play in the next game against the Milwaukee Bucks. What, what, what's just your, I don't know if you want to call it your level of concern, but some of your expectations of how the Lakers use Braun the rest of the way and maybe how cautious they have to be with him. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm concerned because the, the reality is they're not going anywhere without LeBron James. Um, they need him healthy. Darvin Ham used the term severe soreness yep. when describing what was going on with LeBron's ankle. So I don't know if we see him uh, tomorrow against Minnesota. I don't know, you know, how long it's going to be. It's this has been an injury he's been managing all season. So I think you have to be concerned right now because so much of this season and even the way this roster was built, it was about getting LeBron James to the playoffs healthy and then letting him do LeBron James things. I think they've had to rely on him more this season oh, yeah. than they than they wanted to. And I hope that's not that bill isn't coming due here with what five, six weeks to go until the playoffs so the lakers need to move up but at the same time they've got to make sure lebron is healthy because if he's not i don't think it matters what seed they're in they're not getting where they where they want to go without him doing lebron james things in the postseason do, do they got to make sure and and i like the way you you frame that there but do they also got to make sure just no matter what happens and maybe this is under the control maybe it's not we'll see I have said this a couple times on the radio, and I've said this before on YouTube as well. If they're number 10, I just don't feel like the Lakers are getting out of the play, and I just don't I don't feel like winning two games on the road is going to happen. Can it happen? Sure. But if you said, I'll put your money one way or the other, I'm most definitely saying that I don't think they're playing it, you know, past mid-April. Um, do you feel the same way? And I don't – for me, it doesn't even really matter the matchups because every matchup is going to be difficult anyways. Dallas can win, Golden State can win, Sacramento can win. All these teams can is 10 to you does it feel like no matter what you got to get out of that number 10 spot yeah and that's the i think part of it is the the parody in the western conference because it's not just that you're the 10 seed it's not just that you have to win on the road like like you look at what is it it's like chicago and atlanta which chicago's actually won a couple of games uh, that have helped the lakers recently so so yep. thank you bulls but like you're not afraid if it's your opponent is like Atlanta or whatever. That's the East. You look or at the West. Brooklyn or right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right now we're talking, you'd have to win on the road two games and you'd have to beat the Warriors, the Kings, the Mavs, the Pelicans. It would be two of those teams. That's good teams. the caliber of team we're talking about. Those are, yeah, those are good. Those are above 500 good basketball teams that you have to beat on the road in a do or die situation. That's why I, I, I think they have to get up to seven or eight and give themselves two chances to punch their ticket ticket into the playoffs. There's too many good teams that are right here. I don't think you can count on winning back-to-back on the road games uh, this season. That's that's tough. I, they have to move up. But everybody is saying the same thing. Everybody is, is trying. The Warriors are going to try to move up. The Mavs are going to continue to try to move up. And it'll be fascinating to see how this all plays out. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you. I, I don't think you can – you can't finish 10 and expect to move on to the, the proper playoffs. Um, final one, and uh, I'm going to let you go, Trev, and I appreciate you taking the time here on this Saturday. Hopefully everybody um, is enjoying some of the content on this weekend. Um, just matchups-wise, I'm going to ask just the teams that you would like to face if you got to kind of pick mm-hmm. of the play-in tournament, and then the teams you would like to potentially face in the first round. I'm just talking about more – favorable matchups that you feel like, Hey, I like this matchup. Um, and you could feel free to throw in the teams you want to avoid. Yeah. So I would, if it's the play in tournament, I would prefer, I, I, I think Phoenix may drop here. I wouldn't mind seeing the Suns. I wouldn't mind seeing the warriors. Phoenix, uh, the, the toughest schedule left in the NBA. Exactly. Yeah. Their strength of schedule is extremely difficult. That's why I have them potentially dropping, even though there's, they've won their last two, but, um, Phoenix, Golden State, I would prefer to not see Sacramento, obviously. They're 3-0 against the Lakers yeah. this season. 
Uh, the Mavs, I'm kind of 50 50 on. I think the, the Mavs it, have won the Trev, same isn't series. It kind of, isn't it kind of funny that you said, like, if I'd have told you before the season started, you're basically asking for the Phoenix Suns, you're asking for Devin, Bradley Beal, right. and Kevin Durant over the Kings. Yeah. You know, and, and then listen, and the Kings have had the Lakers number, so I, I can't really argue that one. So you say Golden State, Phoenix, you'd prefer to see over the Kings mm. in Dallas 50 50. By the way, I, I'm with you on the Dallas. I, I think the Lakers can beat them, and I also think the Lakers could lose by 15 against them. Yeah. I just don't know which Dallas team would show up. Exactly, and that's the same thing. And, and Mavs fans are the, – the way that Lakers fans feel about Darvinham, that's how Mavs fans feel about Jason Kidd right now. Mm -hmm. So that would be a, a, an interesting dynamic there. But, yeah, the Mavs aren't a team that I would necessarily say the Lakers can't beat or anything like that. And I don't think the Lakers can't beat Sacramento or, uh, or anybody else. But I think that this is – a better matchup. You know, you hear it all the time in the MMA world and boxing a little bit, you know, that, that styles make fights. Yeah. The same is true in the NBA and the play style for Sacramento is just apparently one that the Lakers are going to struggle with there, especially they've got the quick guards that can give the Lakers some, tr some trouble. Sure. So that's where I'd prefer to see somebody else. Now, assuming they survive and they get into uh, the playoffs, the team that I would want to see in round one without question, it's Oklahoma city. The Lakers have had success against them. The Lakers are, can be the bigger, more physical team, and that's a weakness of OKC. They're also a younger team. I think Minnesota presents some matchup problems. Of course, Denver is the team you want to avoid like the plague. Of course. And then uh, the Clippers as well. That's another side that has some interesting matchups for you. It, I, I think the ideal path for the Lakers would be OKC in round one, and then probably the Clippers in round two. Hmm. Maybe the Wolves are in there. Definitely not Denver. You don't... You, you want to avoid Denver as long as you can. If you have to see them with the Western Conference Finals, you have to see them in the finals. Sure. But you're praying that somebody else takes them out on the way in round one or round two uh, if you're the Lakers. So you want that path through OKC and then either the Clippers or the Wolves. And I think I'd actually lean Clippers there, but uh, but it's it's close. It's going to be fun, buddy. It's going to yeah. be fun. Um, we got about a month left in the regular season. Let me see. The last day of the Lakers regular season game is actually April 14th. So a little bit over a month left and a lot can happen. Um, Trev, always uh, love connecting with you. Love talking Lakers basketball with you. I know uh, everybody on these platforms love listening to you as well. So thank you, brother, for the time. Lakers and the Timberwolves tomorrow. Uh, so we'll catch up soon, you and I. But uh, thank you for uh, thank you for doing this, bud. Hey, no problem, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right, that's Trevor Lane, Lakers Nation. Subscribe to subscribe to Hoops Talk. Subscribe to uh, Lakers Nation as well. We'll catch you guys tomorrow after the Lakers uh, take on the Minnesota Timberwolves. Thank you very much.